This is the moment two Hootie drones targeted the USS Harry S. Truman and how a single destroyer had seconds to react. Launched from deep inside Yemen, one drone banked high while the other flew low, trying to sneak beneath US radar coverage. And these drones weren't just being guided in real time. They were already locked in and barreling straight towards the Harry S. Truman. That is, until the USS Gravely spotted them first. But would there be enough time? At 3.43 a.m. local time, deep inside Yemen, a Houthi mobile firing unit launched two Samad 3 drones into the sky. Unlike the Timu builds of years past, these drones are much better engineered for range, stealth, and surprise, and they are heading straight for the aircraft carrier Harry S. Truman. After launching them, the first one banked hard to the northeast and climbed 18,000 feet to conduct a high dive strike. The other drone went a very different route. In a maneuver called sea skimming, this second drone flew just 10 feet above the water's surface, at a speed of about 250 kilometers an hour. This meant the Truman Strike Group had roughly 30 minutes to respond. However, while this might seem like a long time, both drones have features enabled that aim to defeat the Navy's ability to take them out. The first to spot the incoming threats wasn't the Truman itself, but one of her escorts, 20 miles off the port bow, the USS Gravely was on picket duty when the quiet, boring atmosphere of the mid-watch was suddenly interrupted. There on her radar scope were the clear outlines of two fast-moving contacts. Practically instantly, the ship and crew meshed together in perfect harmony to come up with a firing solution to save the Truman. It follows a dynamic process called F2T2EA. F2T2EA stands for Find, Fix, Track, Target, Engage, and Assess, and this concept forms the core of Navy air defense strategy. And it all starts with this, the AN Spy-1 radar. With either three of these arrays for a destroyer or four for a cruiser, this system provides 360-degree coverage from the horizon of zero degrees to its zenith, or highest point of 90 degrees and it forms the backbone of the critical first step in taking out these drones. In the find phase, SPY is looking out to a range of at least 200 nautical miles for any and all air contacts. In this phase, the Aegis combat system, the overall suite that integrates SPY with the ship, is just looking for what is out there, whether it is a missile, a drone, a plane, a cloud, or a bird. During this phase, the radar just needs to get a return from anywhere, the Samad 3 is attempting to defeat this phase by either flying as close to the horizon as possible to be undetected, or using its 1800 kilometer range to come at unexpected angles like really high, low, or behind US ships. Additionally, despite having a wingspan of 4.5 meters and a length of 2.8 meters, it has a relatively small radar cross section of 0.1 square meters, or roughly the size of a piece of copy paper. This small RCS makes tracking hard for most radars, but not SPY. Unable to stay hidden from SPY since it can see targets the size of a golf ball more than 100 miles away, the Samad 3 drones try to exploit the next phase, the fix phase. Now that the SPY radar has both hostile drones on radar, it begins blasting radio waves at a frequency of 2.5 to 3.7 gigahertz to get precise target location data. This data is useful in determining the contact's course, speed, and elevation. For its part, each of the Samad 3 drones begins altering their flight paths and using internal inertial navigation if GPS fails. Hootie operators ashore can modify the GPS destination within a 250 kilometer range in real time. This is especially useful for moving targets, like ships, where shore-based radar arrays can be feeding information to the operator, who then relays the US ship position to the drone. But despite this advanced tactic, SPY knows exactly where these drones are, so it can begin its next phase, track. In the track phase, SPY continues to blast the targets with continuous radar waves and gets ever-increasing data. SPY then passes these to supercomputers called Command and Decision. Known as CND for short, these computers are performing millions of calculations a second on more than 100 different contacts. Even though each drone is traveling at 250 kilometers an hour, Aegis can handle all these updates on targets moving faster than the speed of sound. So getting a beat on these two targets is as easy as making money off the Minecraft movie. It's 100% guaranteed. With firing control solutions now developed on the two targets, there is just one more stage left before missiles leave the cells. Weapon Selection 
In this phase of the engagement, known as targeting, the tactical action officer is essentially doing a high-stakes game of speed dating, and it's all about getting the perfect match. For example, the TAO could shoot this super-advanced SM-6 missile at the drone, but it'd be a waste of a $4 million missile on a $50,000 target. Instead, with the help of Aegis, the TAO has just seconds to decide the right weapon for the job to make a perfect match. In this case, he chooses this missile. It's an SM-2 missile and is the tool that's gonna turn this drone into a bunch of junk. The SM-2 missile is the bread and butter of the Navy's air defense and is the go-to for threats like this. That is because SM-6s are used against advanced threats, SM-3s are for ballistic missiles, SMs are for targets close aboard, anti-submarine rockets are for, well, submarines, and tomahawks are for land targets. But when choosing an SM-2, there are different flavors of SM-2. These missiles, like the Block 3, 3 Alpha, 3 Bravo, and 3 Charlie are all physically pretty similar, but have different seekers and software inside them. Depending on the type of threat, each flavor of SM-2 is better suited for it. One may be better at defeating high divers, while another can take out sea skimmers close to the water. In those few seconds, the TAO confirms the weapon selection and rolls the fire inhibit switch to green. In seconds, the SM-2s are screaming out of their vertical launch cells at about 3.5 times the speed of sound. And this is where the next phase comes into play. In the engagement phase, spy radar establishes uplink with the missiles while in flight. At a speed of dozens of times per second, the spy is essentially asking the missile where it is, and the missile responds. Spy then gives directions to the missile on course changes to steer to get towards the target. As the SM-2 closes within range of the drones, they enter what is called the terminal phase of flight, and these radars become absolutely crucial. These 7.5x7.5 radar arrays are the ANSPG-62 radar arrays, and are the core component of the Mark 99 fire control system. As we just went over, SPY is responsible for guiding the missile until it gets to its last 60 seconds of flight. When it hits this waypoint, the illuminators begin blasting each drone with about 10 kilowatts of power dozens of times a second. These radar waves are somewhere in the 8 to 12 gigahertz range. The SM-2's semi-active seeker knows what specific frequency range this is and hunts it out. Think of it as guiding itself like a moth to a flame. It just can't resist. When the only bright SM-2 detects how close it is to this specific radar radiation, it detonates and sends about 6,000 preformed steel metal fragments at speeds approaching 2,000 meters per second in all directions. And that is where the final phase comes in. The first shot came from the USS Gravely. At 0345 on the dot, the ship's Mark 41 vertical launch cells opened up and released two SM-2 missiles toward the Samad-3 drones. With the speed of Mach 3.5, these missiles were fast enough to cover five miles every seven seconds. As the first missile arced upward, its nose pointed toward the drone cruising at altitude, trying to come in for a high dive strike. Aided by real-time uplinks from the fire control system, the missile made microscopic course corrections as it closed in. Then, at just over 16,000 feet in altitude, it sensed it was close enough, the proximity fuse tripped 15 meters from the target, triggering the missile's airburst fragmentation warhead. Over 3,000 tungsten cubes punctured the airframe in a focus cone. As the first hostile drone disintegrated into pieces, the second missile had a more complex trajectory. The low-flying Samad was hugging the ocean surface, trying to stay hidden in the radar shadows, but Spy held its lock. As the SM-2 streaked toward it, the drone suddenly banked to avoid being hit. But it was too late. The SM-2 suddenly dropped altitude and detonated just ahead of the Samad's nose cone. Metal fragments shredded the airframe, and what remained cartwheeled into the sea, vanishing beneath the waves. After the SM-2s detonated, Spy continually reassessed the debris field to see if there was anything left that could still be a threat. As long as something meets the course, speed, and profile of known hostile missiles, drones, or aircraft, Aegis, and the crew for that matter, can still view it as a threat. This means the crew will keep launching missiles until the radar scope is completely clear. But while the scope may have looked clear for now, little did the sailors of the Truman Strike Group know that this was not the end of the strike. Unknown to the Truman Strike Group crews, the Hooties were preparing a new kind of strike that didn't rely on aging cruise missiles or repurposed Soviet hardware. This time, they were sending in a new weapon that some call the poor man's cruise missile. 
To the untrained eye, the Kasef 2K might look like a cheap knockoff drone, but its origins are far more sophisticated. It's a loitering munition, often called a one-way drone, and a weapon the Houthis hope will turn the tide of the battle. Based almost entirely on the Iranian Ababil T design, the Kasef 2K is manufactured from components smuggled into Yemen from Iran, and then assembled in-country by Houthi forces. At its core, it's a flying explosive payload with wings. Each unit carries up to 30 kilograms of high explosives, designed to detonate just 10 to 20 meters above the ground or slam into a ship's deck, showering everything below with metal fragments across a radius of up to 80 meters. These drones aren't guided in by operators with joysticks. They're pre-programmed to fly to GPS coordinates using inertial guidance, meaning they can be launched in swarms without requiring line of sight or real-time control. They just fly, find their target, and detonate. Their operational range stretches between 100 and 150 kilometers, and with an endurance of 100 minutes and a cruising speed of 250 kilometers per hour, they're more than capable of reaching a U.S. Navy task force operating offshore. Powered by a simple piston engine and capable of reaching altitudes up to 5,000 meters, the Kasef 2K isn't fast or stealthy, but it doesn't have to be. Its strength lies in numbers. Unknown to the strike group, the Houthis have secretly pulled out dozens of these drones from a secret stash, and they are heading straight towards the strike group. Bye for now.